Podcast. I'm your host, Ricardo Verandez, also known as Ricky Verandez. We have an amazing, amazing show. As I always try to do is bring some really interesting guests and some really interesting ideas and topics. And recently I've been trying to do more of, you know, probably within the last year or two, uh, I try to do more of bringing not just one or two interesting guests, but maybe do a roundtable discussion. And Today we had an amazing show with people from three of my favorite podcasts, Sam Tripoli from Tinfoil Hat Podcast, James Corbett from The Corbett Report, and Pat Militich and Jeffrey Wilson from The Conspiracy Farm. And all these guys have been on the podcast before. Uh, Sam has been on uh, before once. Uh, Jeff and Pat have been on before once. And James has been on a whole bunch of times. and was actually, I don't know, probably five years ago, one of the first... A uh, real big, well-known guest that I had on the show, so, and and since then we've always stayed in contact and had tons of amazing shows, uh, talking about everything from his new documentaries that have come out throughout the years, and and many other things that are happening in the world. So uh, definitely go in the archives, check that stuff out. I won't uh, take up too much of your time because this was such an amazing uh, conversation. I want to let you guys just jump right into it and 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 enjoy it. But uh, remember to support our guest's work. Uh, I, I think most of everybody, including myself, have a Patreon page. Support people. The, the, it makes it a little easier to help uh, keep us going and to, to help finance what, in many cases, and at least personally in, in my case, has become an awful investment because it, it consumes more money than, than it makes. And, and uh, I've never really been in the positive. But, but that's not the point. I mean, and my work, James's work, and I'm sure uh, Jeff and and and, uh, and Pat and Sam, uh, we're all about spreading this information. That's why my work's op- open source. James's work uh, is open source. So please uh, tweet this stuff, uh, share it on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever social media you use. Please share these uh, these podcasts, share these conversations. I think it's super important, and you never know who's listening who's going to run into uh, our shows, this discussion, and uh, maybe change the way they look at things and, and maybe hopefully help them get down a rabbit hole of discovering a different way of looking at things and, and some historical facts and information they might not be aware of and uh, and go down that rabbit hole like we all have at one time. So, um, so thanks again, guys. Support the show. Share it, like I mentioned. And uh, I'll see you guys on the next one. Let's get right at it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. I don't know why. I've never done more than than four guys. I have to be honest. So this. That's uh, what she said. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're starting off right off the bat, Jeff. Yeah. I knew it was just a matter of time before a couple of dick jokes or something. So this might go <laughs> off the rails quickly. <laughs> dick jokes are my bread and butter, dude. <laughs> well, well. Anyways, while I'm trying to figure out how to throw myself on the screen, I want to thank you guys for being on. I really, really appreciate it. As you guys know, I'm a huge fan of all your all your work because that's why you guys have been on the show in the past, and I, I don't have anybody on who I'm not a fan of. And we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all attempting to uh, get attention on stories and spark conversations that we think there's not enough attention on. And no better way than getting all of us together to help do that. But also, I think one thing that's uh, I think will make for a very interesting conversation is the fact that we're, we all have so much in common when it comes down to our curiosity and our interests. But yet, yeah, we come from very different backgrounds. So I think 
mm-hmm. you know, talking about topics that we're all into Come and on. intrigued with, it'd be awesome to to just see what everybody's perspective is based on this. Uh, <laughs> Pat's never not working. He's a uh, <laughs> well, he's a, that's a the right Skype selfie. I've never seen yeah. that before. Yeah. 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 Right? You just invented something there, champ. <laughs> but yeah. you know, yeah, post it out there. Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I think today it's uh, it's you know quantity over quality. Uh, I think people who are super active, even if uh, it's not quality work, those are people who get attention. So, uh, but hopefully we can we can spark a, a really good conversation. One thing that I we we briefly talked about uh, James's great work, and I, I mentioned it on uh, one of our pre- previous emails. I think World War One is definitely one of those topics people don't know enough about, and I love the fact that you spend some time to do a doc documentary on it because i mean i've i've did i've done a lot of world war one research and there's so much stuff that i had no no idea about in your in your uh well up to part two which came out uh previously and you know i've watched you know promises and betrayals uh uh blood and oil or i think that's what it's called uh there's a, a couple really good documentaries and not even those scratch the surface compared to what your work has done and and you know and that's kind of what we've come to know from uh james corbett and the corbett report is that you really do thorough research and we can always count on uh this amazing uh work when it does come out and uh so so thanks again james for for do, doing that for everybody if you ha- you haven't checked it out please check it out it's on his website it's also on youtube it's all open source so uh yeah. but that's really important too. support everybody's work because that's the other thing too is that uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, James was just a teacher at, at one point and then decided to do this alternative media. And uh, and now, you know, he's been lucky enough to, to do this for a living. And uh, it's because of the support and he puts all his stuff out there for free. So I know it's and we live in a world where it's really easy just to consume free content because there's so much of it and, and not support. But if we love the work that they're putting out there, uh, we have to remember that the way we continue getting that work is supporting them. So that's super important too. I think James has a brand of excellence that within the community is is uh, the gold standard. I think uh, everybody kind of looks to uh, his work and uh, realizes that this is probably the uh, most legit shit you're ever going to get. And there's a lot of respect in that. I. Uh, you know, I, I learned a lot about Hitler from James's videos. You know, for me, it's like it was wide open, and uh, you know, and for me in my podcast, I don't. I'm not even going to pretend that I'm in like a realm with what James is doing because I'm kind of trying to get people to be like the training wheels or kind of the like, you know, conspiracy for dummies, and that you know, give it a little bit of information, and hopefully they'll go out there. And I, you know, I tell them to go listen to like people like Conspiracy Farms, the Higher Side Chats. The Colbert Report, you know, uh, I think that he's I think what James does and what we all do is very, very important. And that we're fighting against billions of dollars that are spent to basically brainwash these people. And, you know, I live in L.A., which is the heart of a lot of this stuff, the brainwashing and all that. And with these fires that we've seen, like these are some dark arts fires. I don't care what anybody says. And you look at like the the burn patterns and it, it just doesn't make any sense. And here we go again, the conspiracists are being demonized just like after the JFK shootings and uh, the 9-11 and then Vegas and all that stuff. And, you know, it's people like James and, you know, it's the conspiracy farms get some really amazing uh, guests on and. It's just, uh, I just, you know, I just am really thankful to be on this call. And I really, uh, I'm really enjoying what everybody's doing who, who are involved in this podcast right now. I'd love for, I'd love for James and I know he's going to, you know, the, the World War One stuff has always fascinated me. And I'd love, you know, for, a, you know, obviously can't go over everything here, but, you know, the, for the, for the dummies, the bullet points, you know, and, and uh, because this stuff is, stuff is so important for people to learn history, you know, about, about those wars, how they were how how they were started, fomented, and it's it's super super important. 
It's incredibly important, and I'm, I'm glad to see that a lot of people have resonated with this. I truly wasn't expecting people to be interested in this at all. Uh, I'll let you guys in on a little secret just between us four and the, anyone who happens to be listening in. Uh, this is part of a larger documentary project that I'm working on. The World War One conspiracy is only the first part of it. So I was expecting right. until this whole project is finished, I wouldn't think people would even kind of get what's going on. But I'm glad a lot of people have resonated with it, and I'm glad to hear that that this has provided a lot of information for people that they haven't heard of. But for me, from my perspective, my nightmare is trying to compile thousands of pages of research down into here's a half hour on this, you know, 15 years of history. And here's a half hour on this other five years. It's it's horrible. It's nightmarish for me <laughs> because I'm just sitting here. How do I do this? So I'm glad to hear that. But if people are interested in this, they really should start delving into the sources where there are literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of documentation on just that first part, that first half hour of the documentary, you can find in books like Hidden History by Doherty McGregor uh, that has so much more detail to it. But the long story short, I guess, is um, coming from sources like this, the Anglo-American Establishment by Carol Quigley, where he talked about the, uh, the formation of a secret society in the late 1890s. It started to come together in the 1880s, um, but really formalized in some form in the 1890s. And it's a secret society, but we know about it. It's not a conspiracy theory. We know uh, that this is true because one of the inside people in that conspiracy blew the whistle, essentially. Uh, William T. Stead, he was this journalist um, who was quite influential at the time. And after Cecil uh, B. Rhodes' death in 1902, he blew the whistle, essentially. He published the uh, last will and testament, which everyone thinks, oh, you know, Cecil Rhodes' last will and testament was establishing the Rhodes Scholarship. Yeah, that was his seventh will. <laughs> the first six were all about this secret society that he wanted to found to spread the British Empire around the world and, you know, unite the world under the English race, basically. And so the, he published all of this. Uh, as I point out in the documentary, it was even published in the New York Times and everything. Here was Cecil Rhodes' secret society that he founded. And Cecil Rhodes' idea was this is going to be a secret society like, uh, organized like the Jesuits. This kind of Illuminati-ish thing with this inner circle, the secret uh, society of the elect. And then there was going to be an outer circle that didn't even know of the inner circle's existence and all of this. And he wanted all of these different titles and everything. Uh, but the people he brought in to that conspiracy, like Alfred Milner, who the hell was Alfred Milner? You never get taught him in the history books these days, but he was extremely influential. And he was the one who basically started to organize this into something practical. It's like, oh, yeah, all that hoodoo, you know, focus, pocus nonsense about secret societies. Let's make this something real. And he started really forming what was called Milner's Kindergarten in South Africa, of this group of uh, young men that uh, went on to hold all sorts of important posts in government and outside of government in private industry as well that basically formed this clique that could be drawn on to uh, to essentially operate what was the longer term game plan which in that first decade of the 20th century became let's go to war with Germany and that's what it all became about and they used every single lever of power that they had in government and outside of government to make that happen. Speak, speak to that, James. Why, why, why was Germany such a threat? I mean, I, I realized once they became independent in 1871, that was just – that went straight against what those guys, Milner and those guys were trying to do. Why? Why was Germany such a threat? Well, I, it's analogous, and this is actually what got me starting along these lines and why I – started thinking about World War One was because it is analogous to our situation today, which is um, we have the world empire, which in this case is the U.S., and we have the rising empire threat, which is China. And we see a lot of parallels going on. At that time, in early 20th century, it was the world empire was Britain, and the rising upstart was Germany, and they had to be defeated. They had to be put down. And that was, I mean, that wasn't anything new to that era of history. Britain had always done that throughout history. Their entire strategy had always been to support the second strongest European continental power against the strongest, so that there would never be one that would rise up and would be able to challenge Britain's um, hegemony. Coke and that was, versus they, Pepsi. That's Coke versus Pepsi. Like, they go at each other, but they make well, sure this the third is, one doesn't yeah, come Yeah, this in. is where we have to understand, it's like taking a 2D slice of a 3D object. So we see these kind of national 
strife situations like China and the U.S. And there is something there. There is this 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 clash that's happening. And a lot of people are invested in that clash in a lot of different ways, sometimes quite literally invested. But th that's really happening. But if you don't see the 3D picture of it, you don't really understand it. So um, so in this case, in the China U.S. case, uh, the point that I always make is that China didn't just become this big emerging power. They were fostered into this power by the very same people who are also puppeteering the U.S. government in and, and steering its foreign policies. How does this happen? Well, it's because it's part of a larger plan, ultimately, to get the world under a collectivist system, globalism, essentially, and which is just so frustrating because nobody, nobody gets that, bro. You're, I mean, obviously, a conspiracy theorist. Obviously, it, this is chess, not checkers. You know, this, yeah. this, this, you know, people who talk chess. against people, <laughs> exactly people who talk against conspiracy theorists. Your, your guys, William Steed, Reginald Brett, and Cecil Rhodes, they came up with this plan in 1891 to basically it's a long start game. the long game to start war. And it took, what, another 15, 16, 20 years before it really... No, no, no. You see, their secret society was about peace. They wanted yeah, to bring wow. peace to the world. But peace, of course, means peace under the British flag. And how do you do that? Oh, well, we need war. Well, exactly. <laughs> but I'm just saying, the way for the lay person who always poo-poos what we talk about, there is so much more nuance that's th to this than people realize. It is the long game, as my boy Sam just said. And our, our attention spans are just so short. You know, we're keeping up with the Kardashians over here. We don't think of the long game. And here it is. You know, hundred. You know, World War One was pretty much the the template for the, the beginning of the the Matrix as we know it today. James, did you find anything that maybe has to do with like old biblical uh, scripture in terms of like uh, uh, the lost tribes of Israel versus the pagans? There's, you know, I did a whole episode with this guy who's like really, uh, you know, an expert in the Bible, and he broke down that there's a lot of like old scripture where it's like the the lost tribes, which is Britain and uh, the United States within uh, Israel versus the pagans, which is going to be led by Germany. Does that have anything to play in or is that just, you know, smokescreen stuff? Uh oh, no audio. We there we, oh, yeah. We, we can't James, hear you. you have no audio. James, you have no audio. Start that over, bud. We can't hear you, James. You sorry. Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. I've only been doing this for a decade, guys. Come on. I, I, I'm not going to know where the mute button is. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. That's a bit out of my area of expertise. But what I can talk about is the Zionist movement um, forming in the late 19th, early 20th century, extremely influential in uh, insofar as the Rothschild family, which, of course, was in a position of prominence in the early 20th century in Britain um, financially and was trying to convert that into geopolitical power and did so through, um, as we know, the Balfour Declaration came out in 1917. That was a letter from Arthur Balfour to uh, Lord Rothschild saying, hey, you know, when this is all over, we're going to give you Palestine, essentially, as part of your Zionist dream of creating the homeland for the Jews. And um, that was, I mean, pretty interesting because, well, Britain didn't control Palestine at that point. Uh, um, sorry. What's going on, Pat? Pat, do you also have the mute button on? Pat, you have the mute button. We can't hear you. I can't hear you. Pat, there we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear there we go. Me? I, I, well, I, mean, I, you I was doing the I was doing the anti Semite alarm going off for everyone <laughs> that watches us who thinks that everyone here is against Israel and and uh, the Israeli people. So no, we're not. Um, just pointing out facts is what James is doing, and, and that exactly all historical documented facts that no. the Balfour Declaration. But the interesting thing about the Balfour Declaration, it's presented as this was a letter from Arthur Balfour to Lord Rothschild. It actually started as notes that Rothschild sent over to Balfour and Milner, yeah. and they took those notes and worked with them and made a letter to present back to Lord Rothschild. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's like the interesting part of it. It shows who was really in control of that relationship. And while we're picking, while we're picking your brain, James, I. Think I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are on the supposed uh, Albert Pike 1871 letter to Mazzini. Um, I mean, I've known about that letter for quite a number of years. Um, whether it's factual, whether it was written by Albert Pike or not, um, I don't really care at this point because, well, I mean, it's, it's at least prophetic in what's happening now. And it, the And the letter I know was appeared many many years ago um but but whether it was written by Albert <laughs> Pike don't know have you ever seen it i certainly haven't well, uh, it doesn't exist seen, as far as i as i'm aware it. 
What's that? Uh, it, it doesn't exist as far as I'm aware. It's not real. Um, I, I'd love to be proven otherwise. Anyone who can show me that letter or any proof that that letter really exists in the archives anywhere, I'd love to see it. I don't believe right. it exists. Okay. Um, and I, and I'm certain, well, I'm certain okay. it was written after World War II because it, the way that it predicted what was going to happen with the National Socialists in Germany and everything, I mean, come on. It, it, I absolutely don't believe it. But, no, um, uh, but I, it's interesting that it does tap in to something that people understand is coming. And it, it, is, it is framing, it, it, that letter does ultimately frame the next stage of this, that it's going to be a kind of a religious war, essentially, that eventually is going to lead to the, the bright light of Lucifer will be seen as the saving grace, and the masses will come to embrace and accept that. Is ultimately you say, that with, a, you say that with a You say that with a smile. I do. Uh, I do, because, again, I don't believe that this is really predicting anything, except perhaps in terms of wish fulfillment for certain members of the elite, obviously. Uh, yeah. But I don't think, you know, anything's been set in stone. I think it's safe to say that World War Three would be a certainly, as it said, a cataclysmic event, right? Absolutely. Yes. James, in your uh, in your research, does uh, black nobility come in at all? I started to do some research on them and their roles, you know, and as uh, Jeffrey said before to me that, you know, they make the Rothschilds look like uh, accountants or secretaries. Uh, and I feel like nobody really knows about black nobility and almost this point where I, I sometimes begin to think that the Rothschilds are almost used as like a boogeyman type group, you know, like Russia kicks out the Rothschilds but they're still part of the Bank of International Settlements, which is that runs all the centralized banks. So, like, what is, is there a power structure that goes beyond the Rothschilds and that whether it's black nobility, the black pope, the, the uh, royal family of England, is it goes even deeper than that? Uh, a couple of things to say. First of all, I don't believe in the monolithic conspiracy that there is one one group or one family or one name or whatever that controls everything. I think that's a little too simplistic. Secondly, uh, yeah, for people who are really in positions of real power and influence, if we know their name, they're probably not at the top of that ladder. So, yeah. Precisely. Uh, yep. You know, you know I mean, their and, name. Yep. Exactly. And it becomes that thing where, well, of course, we. Uh, there's no way we can really ascend to the top of that unless, you know, some whistleblower comes out. But uh, the, I think that distracts uh, – my point is it always comes back to that distracts us from the real point of this, which is that, yes, power is wielded by people with, with money and influence and control in ways that we probably can't even fathom. And you can research your entire life and probably never get to the bottom of that. But – Th then you've spent your entire life just trying to research what they're doing. The point is what we can do with our own power, because we do have power and influence in our own lives. And yes, we can't control everything that happens in the world, and we can't control what the big powers are going to do in warfare and what have you, but we get to choose what we invest our time and energy doing with our lives. And that's the ultimate point of this for me, is that yeah, you can spend your whole life trying to chop off the heads of the beast. I tend to think even if you did find the head of that beast and chop it off, there'd be another, another one growing in, in days. I mean, the, the power vacuum would just be too much. And The, the making the awareness that there in. is a beast, I think, is a huge problem. People don't think right. necessarily the there point, is a beast in the first place. The point is we are the heart of the beast. We pump the blood through the vessels of the beast. We are the willing participants in this system. Every time yes, you buy dude. one of their projects, every time you, you invest your time and energy in this, you are helping the beast. If silence silence is acquiescence. Exactly. If you take yourself out of that pyramid structure, it collapses. It it needs us. That's Defeated. the real point that's of this. That's why I love the Morpheus picture. Can... The Morpheus picture in the Matrix of him holding up the battery saying that's basically what we are. It's just energy feeding it. And that's and cool. take Metaphor yourself out of that. And then so the James, machine doesn't just... cooperate. Um, we have that, to understand it's our responsibility to do that. And that's that's more important to me than trying to spend our entire lives finding out who's the head. So now right. that you framed it that way, um, not spending our time going after them, but using our time constructively on what we can do to prepare to uh, mitigate whatever we can, uh, the damage that's done to us personally, to our families, whatever, things like that. Um, I say we start a PayPal to huh. purchase a missile silo in Kansas and turn it into a condo. Have you seen yeah. those? Those are so dope. Those are <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen those before? 
Well, no. no. Oh, yeah. oh, no, they, they're straight up missile silos. They're like 15 levels, and they're straight just... A triple A, dude. It's like you're walking into like a Mandalay Bay hotel. I'm serious. They're super sweet, and that I think like we can pull it off. I think we can. I think we can pull it off. <laughs> well, so he just gave away our plan. Damn well, it! I, I think what James was saying is so important because we, James and I have had this conversation and similar conversations many a times on on the Ripple Effect podcast, and you know we we often emphasize the idea of trying to to spark uh, just thought and and looking at things from a different perspective and how important that is and and to quote sam uh one of my favorite quotes is uh the revolution will be podcasted and it's <laughs> it's it's a great uh quote because that's exactly what we're trying to do and you know the most dangerous people aren't people who are trying to change things with violence but it's people who are changing minds and and opening minds and changing perspectives because that does cause a ripple effect and a lot of times you get people you know asking you well you know how what are you going to do to change the world you know well how are you going to change things you know so almost acting like the simple thing of sparking thought and having a conversation and changing somebody's perspective isn't doing something i think that's almost one of the most important things you could do and probably can have the biggest impact you know it's you can who knows how many people are going to listen to this podcast and and even if that number is small we're going to change their minds and and maybe change the way they look at things and they're going to have conversations with other people and they're going to have conversations with other people and they're going to have and it does start this ripple effect and the, you know when i started this show it was because i truly believed in this idea that we can all make a difference and i mean you look at uh, most of us we you know besides uh pat who is a, a legendary hall of famer but most of us come from pr pretty, you know, normal backgrounds where, you know, we didn't, <laughs> you know, we can't, we come from, you know, when I, you know, we weren't, um, we weren't well known for, uh, well, I, you know, James and I, and, 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 you know, at least I know our backgrounds pretty well. You know, we we're basic, normal dudes who just kind of believed in, in trying to do something more with our lives, trying to do something more fulfilling and, and doing some alternative news and alternative media in hopes that it, it, we can spread something. And uh, so I think, you know, th conversations like this are so important. Like James said, we could focus so much on dissecting who's, you know, who's involved and connecting all the dots and all that stuff is so important because there are stories out there that do help you put the puzzle pieces together because I do think that, you know, this whole, you know, life is a giant, you know, th million, pu has a million puzzle pieces and we're all together trying to gather puzzle pieces. And if we all help each other out, we can gather enough puzzle pieces where at the end of the road, maybe we don't know what that image is, but we have a clear idea. We have a better idea of what it might be. Or, so, or, or we pull a matrix and have a, have a moment like, there is no puzzle. Just like in the Matrix, I was wondering how to bend the spoon. There is no spoon. And I, I agree with what you're saying. And even with, I'll echo the sentiments of James as well. I mean, trying to, you know, figure out who, what, where, what trajectory, how many bullets were shot and, you know, Kennedy or how, what's the melting point of steel, et cetera, et cetera. Once you get to the point that it wasn't that official story, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole a little bit, but just that recognition that you were just being lied to on such a crazy level. The, the World War One thing, not to go back to it, but you're talking about three or four, maybe five, six, seven individuals that hatched a plan which a decade plus later killed 20 million plus people. Injured, and, you know, another and I think that's million. Important, you know, it's important on the World War One thing to frame it, if James could, you know, briefly for people who are watching this, because... As you said, it's kind of the blueprint for future, for future wars, for everything else else that we've seen from that point forward. And and so, you know, for us, I mean, I feel like I'm completely mind fucked sometimes uh, because we're called you know lunatics and everything else when the to the war. And and this was prophesized. We knew that this was coming, um, or people well before us knew that this was coming. And. You know, so I, I I think it's important for us to be able to at least break through on that level, so that when 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 a guy dies in Libya who was creating the gold coin, you know, to, to trade his oil in, um, when Saddam Hussein dies because Europe uh, is going to buy his oil without the U.S. dollar, you know, all this sort of stuff, and and so that people realize that no, we're not the fucking crazy ones here. We're we're not the we're not the lunatics. Yeah. So James, if you, I'd like James to at least go through some of the, the yeah. you know, points that, that caused World War One and uh, stuff that, that people are not taught in the history books. 
Well, there's a couple of points I want people to take away from this documentary, one of which relates to our earlier discussion there. Um, uh, just the, the, the amount of propaganda that was aimed at the public to get them into hating Germans uh, in England and in America uh, was phenomenal. And when you really drill down into it, that's where so much of our modern day propaganda templates come from was that First World War, where they literally created the, the Bureau of Propaganda and all of that. And Babies right. on bayonets. And Exactly. Yeah, there was such a concerted effort and they brought so much effort to bear on convincing the public. And one thing that speaks to is the fact that the public's opinion matters. They wouldn't be spending bajillions of dollars in all of this effort to try to convince the public to hate Germans unless it mattered what the public actually felt. So don't ever forget that it's your power that they are trying to 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 take over essentially right. with this propaganda. The other part is, yeah, I hope people understand almost it's almost unimaginable um, the pre-World War I uh, world to a post-World War I mindset because everything that we know about the modern world came from that World War I period or was started there or fostered there, um, including uh, it, obviously technologically. Uh, this was the breaking point in terms of military history from the stately, you know, 19th century kind of warfare where you would line armies up on a battlefield and they'd shoot at each other for a day. And you could even go with, a, you know, f with your family for a picnic near the battlefield and watch it from, from afar. And, you know, you, it would be like a, a spectator sport in some ways. Uh, you couldn't do that in World War I. Um, and that, that's obviously there's the technological changes that, that made that happen. The machine gun and the flamethrower and the airplane and the poison gas and the tanks and all of the other technological gadgets. Um, but beyond that and beyond the million casualty battles and things that were just utterly unimaginable before World War One, it was the intervention of the government in every aspect of society that would have been, if not unthinkable, at least uh, would not have been very popular before that World War One crisis set in. And this was not only known about and acknowledged, but o openly lusted after by a lot of people in the time. And this is actually what I'm going to get into in part three. Um, which is yet to be released as we're recording this conversation. But I'm going to be talking about the, the John Deweys and the Richard T. Ely's and other people like that who were openly talking about, you know, the, the war will be great to, uh, to foster a new sense of national, you know, uh, national uh, service in, in society and to get people on board and to shape public uh, perception and opinion. This is what people were lusting after for a long time. And in, um, in the American context specifically, you have the income tax coming in uh, with the Federal Reserve in 1913. And Woodrow that was Wilson. Like, uh, under Wilson, who was brought in by Morgan, uh, bankrolled yeah. into uh, office by Morgan, essentially. Um, and that was the basis through which America um, was able to wage and finance the First World War, finance by, you know, starting the... The, uh, the incredible debt that uh, we, all, we know where it's ended up today, um, but also um, the, just the idea of income tax and um, the government being in charge of the economy or managing the economy. A central bank, oh, which we had been a, against for so long. A central bank for the first time in 80 years or whatever it had been at that point. So yes, it was an extremely important period for that transition into what we now expect. And it was really the precursor for the New Deal and all of that it came from that World War One mentality where the government was going to take care of everything. And uh, if we don't understand that aspect of it, then we don't really have a proper sense of, of history. And the fact that we are living in the crater of that explosion, as I say in the opening of the World War One documentary, if we don't understand that the way the world is now is not the way it has to be, this isn't this isn't just, uh, you know, some inevitable progress to this point. This is something that happened because but people that's what I mean, to echo Pat's Pat's oh, to echo Pat's frustration. I mean, this is World War One. I. I mean, fast forward almost 100 years the the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter talking about incubators getting knocked over. You know, all of these. I mean, it's nothing has changed. They're it's literally the playing stuff. from the same playbook. And again, we are so willing participants of it because we're just not aware how sophisticated the propaganda is and the, the behind the scenes that, you know, for people just want that shortcut to thinking that fast food news, like what's going on? Oh, they're bad guys. Okay. As opposed to like, wow, this is a chess game and you are like several steps behind. And it's just so frustrating, bro, because at the end of your movie or just the second part, you know, when we finally did get in the war, you saw those scenes of just guys dancing with girls in the streets, just getting piled on buses and ships, and they just went and died by the millions for 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 bullshit, man. Bankers, it's crazy. Dude. Bankers. It's crazy. And well, it's this is where this is where the you know um, 
G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, is so important for every high school student in America to read. Um, man, I've, I've read that thing like four times. There it is, man. Ah, uh, James. Yes, nice. one of the greatest <laughs> books ever written. And that's the thing is, fast forward to Donald Trump, whether you well, like it. Hold on, it. guys. Hold on. Let's not, let's not, let's, I mean, we know what that is. Let somebody, you know, somebody fill that in. What is, what happened at the Jekyll Island? That was a big deal. That's when all the bankers got together and, and basically uh, wrote the Federal Reserve Act and, and uh, duped some politicians into uh, passing it. Wilson, Wilson won the election um, because because they talked uh, Roosevelt into running for a third term, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, against Taft and Wilson, and he took he and that was a banker's that was a banker's to get uh, to get Roosevelt to run again. And here's the thing that's crazy, dude. Um, had Roosevelt gone on his Amazon his Amazon expedition when he was supposed to, it would have never happened, and time would have changed. Taft would have won that election, and we would have never got the Federal Reserve because Taft was against it. But the bankers talked him into running. He did, took votes away from Taft. Wilson won. They already had Wilson in their hip pocket. Wilson was the one that uh, pushed for this thing, got the got the Federal Reserve Act passed. Well, they and, snuck it in in a holiday or something over Christmas. Yes, yes, over Christmas. Most most everybody was home. And the thing is that's, that's you know, about this is, um, you know, it gives obviously the privateers control of everything, you know, who many of whom are not even Americans, uh, control of our monetary system, which should piss every American off. But, um, and the reason I'm fast forwarding right now is to make the connection for people that might not know about it is that Trump, whether you like him or not, on the campaign trail, spoke about getting rid of the Federal Reserve briefly. He made a couple tiny little blip mentions of it. And then he's mentioned it again a couple weeks ago. He talked about the Federal Reserve. And I think if he's reelected, which I think he will be, I think in his second term, he'll kill the Federal Reserve. Ah, uh, that's that. Oh, I don't, yeah. don't think not so. Happening. <laughs> I'll bet you on that. <laughs> let's let's have a little wager on that one. How much I just wanted to say something real quick. I, I think, to go back I, think he wants to go down. I think he wants to be uh, remembered for something. I think something maybe he got it. in, dude, and then they're like, "Yeah, hey, we'll wipe your whole family out." And like, he's changed a little. But I just want to say something about what James said. That this isn't how it has to be. When Jeffrey's like, "That's a hundred years ago." In human time, that's a lifetime. But in like history, that's just a drop in the bucket, man. And we are in a place where we can turn this. We, you know, I, I try to echo what James says. I say it poorly compared to how he says it, but <laughs> we really are a very unique country, the United States. The global economy is completely built on us. And we, if we come together, we're a very powerful for force. But this propaganda bill that Obama passed, which allows the government to use propaganda against us, is get us to not like each other, to get us. Which was going on anyway. They just legalized right. it. But this legalized it. But, you know, everybody wants to make Chocolate Jesus this wonderful dude. And he's like, he's just part for the course, man. But this isn't how it has to be. We I are agree, the more brother. powerful than them. I mean, yep. if we, I, I mean, like, dude, we don't have to sit here and take it. But everybody thinks hey, we have to go between these two parties. It's like running between Dahmer and O.J. Simpson. You're like, they're both <laughs> still, they're both going to murder you. What, do, what are we doing here? We just really The masses just don't know. I, I had a conversation with journalist, Canadian journalist Eva Bartlett about you know the, the, the occupation of ISIS in Syria. It's a horror movie. People do not get waking up to that every day, having your daughter kidnapped, possibly raped, organs taken. I mean, it's we just don't get over here how dark it is. We're, we're in fantasy football mode and the Rams are seven and one or whatever it is. I'm not knocking. You could do it if you want to, but please balance it out with some level of information on the world because silence is acquiescence. That's why all this stuff is so allowed to go down because we're so well, blissfully we, ignorant. We, we are. Well, but, but Sam sounds, Sam sounds hopeful that we can actually make a difference that we're going to somehow um, bring Americans together to be able to, stop this train wreck and uh 
It doesn't even have to be Americans. That's, that's almost that's part of the problem. Groups. That's why we're we're so cool with half million plus I'm not Iraqis. American, by the way, <laughs> well, Just I mean, for the record, it, yeah. you, it's the human uh, being either, thing, man. Actually. Not not to go all kumbaya, but that's why you know so many millions are allowed to die in Syria or be displaced or in Iraq through through sanctions that killed women, women men, women, and children. We always filter it through this us versus them. We're yeah. human beings before any of that, that shit. That's where I want to know. I want to know which. Be a little dangerous. I want to know. I'm sorry. I, I was just... I, nationalism and and being patriotic. I think it can be a little dangerous because I, I it's it's similar to the tribal conservative versus liberal. It's disliking somebody, uh, d- demonizing another tribe, another group of people, and it, it's like like you said. I mean, not to sound like a hippie, you know, like uh, George Carlin, but you know, we are all one. We're all on this earth together. Where I I, I think, you know. It, and there's, there's a club and you ain't in it. <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. You know, and, and I think there's nothing wrong with being proud. I mean, I was born in Portugal. I'm very proud of my culture. You know, I, I uh, you know, it, and there's nothing. And But the thing is, I also understand every culture. I have friends from Estonia. I have friends that are from Salvador. I have friends from, uh, you know, all over the world. And there's beautiful things about all their all, all their cultures, and I and and I think that. Boy Brigado, boy Brigado. <laughs> but but, but then Portuguese. framing that. Then framing those thoughts of of a globalist kumbaya, we know their end goals with globalism, and we also know how important the United States Constitution is, and how important it is to be protected against the aims of globalism and you know the the cloward pivots of collapsing a system financially and making us all you know slaves of of complete socialism, um, and so that so for me. Um, Constantina wire at our southern border and stopping those people from pouring over, I think is the just and right thing to do. This is a nation of laws and it has to be. And I'm a guy that's married to a woman who came from another country uh, on a student visa. She did not speak English when she got here. She became a doctor studying in a language that she didn't even know. She was smart enough to do that. She added to the benefit and the, and the upside of this country and she did everything legally. And I, I gotta tell you, um, you know, the kumbaya stuff, I don't agree with at all. I, I agree, don't blow the shit out of every other nation, but you're not coming here and pouring over and, and overloading the system because with 5 billion or more people below the poverty line of, of Mexico and other nations, um, we can't possibly help the world by allowing a million of them in at a time. We're, we're not going to do it. We're going to do... Um, everything opposite of that we're going to destroy our own nation and then there's no hope for the world at all because we have to be the shining beacon that uh, that actually is, is I, a, I, mean, a I don't think i don't think it's necessarily a kumbaya i mean I, I definitely think we need to protect our borders and have like your wife you know come through legally but this whole conversation in the last 40 minutes has been I mean, I, I appreciate the constitutional conversation, but they began. Well, they've been they've been wiping their ass with it for a long time. But they certainly well, began sure. in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act and the creating oh, yeah. of the income tax or the federal income tax, which was found in the Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. Direct tax on wages was found unconstitutional numerous times. So I mean, I, I get that constitutional argument, but I mean. And I'm not saying let's go beyond that because those things afford us some of the best laws and best protections in the world. But at the end of the day, man, I mean, tomorrow's the 55th anniversary when they a coup d'etat took place and blew our head president's head off in broad daylight. No accountability. We can go down the list of the shit. There's no accountability. So, I mean, the, you know, they're declaring wars without going through Congress. You know, the constitutional argument I get. But I mean, when, when are we going to start in really enforcing that? Because this shit's been going on for a long time. And well, that, that is, the up, that is up to the time. people. That, that ultimately has to be is. up to the people, and and the Constitution was a roadmap for us. Um, you know, when when our leaders were breaking the Constitution, which they have been, as you mentioned, and we all know for many decades, um, that we should be revolting. We should be either at least a tax revolt. You know, and throughout history, tax revolts are about a fifty fifty in terms of the the leaders dying or an awful lot of citizens dying. So, but but if everyone think of this, guys, if if everyone who was, quote unquote, an independent contractor, owned their own business, um, people who had to file 1099s, people who had to pay quarterly taxes, you know, the people who really, truly pay the taxes, if everyone who did that in the nation or half of us filed an extension and then another extension and then another extension attached to demands and said, this is this is what we want, this is what we want, would they listen or would they arrest or kill all of us? 
I, I think that's one water. way the one way to remove the participation. I think there are so many different facets, like James was saying. I mean, like we've been kind of agreed on, we're all willing participants of this, so we have to kind of remove ourselves, whether it's taxes, whether it's you know financial issues, boycotts, et cetera, for some of these banks, go to a credit union. I mean, however you want to do it, but you know. We've Just talked about it on the show, Pat, how they make, you know, correcting rain illegal. They frown on self-sufficiency. They want you right, on their right. dole. You the, have to the be. Sheer mention, just the, the sheer mention of how I talked about tax revolts and possibly a map for how to get it done in modern times. Um, welcome to the uh, audit next year, Mr. Milicic. <laughs> yeah. They use it as a tool. It's a weapon for sure. For sure. James, I want to ask you about uh, China real quick and the role of international bankers in the in the growth of that, because I feel like when it came to the United States that they could blend in very easily with uh, Americans, right? I mean, we see politicians who have dual citizenship and you, I, I mean, two years ago, I would never have even known that was possible. It wasn't through, you know, joining this kind of truth community. I learned this. Is that the same thing that's gonna happen in China? Because they can't really blend in. And I feel like China, if you kind of sell out there, there's a, there's there's death at the end of the move. You know, we're here. It's like we see like the Clintons fighting tooth and nail. We have this email problem where it's like there's a good chance she sold secrets to China. And that's what people are trying to hide. And uh, I mean, will there ever be any kind of, uh, you know, punishment for that? And what's your thoughts in with China and the international bankers? Well, uh, people can go and look at a podcast I did a few years ago called China and the New World Order, where I laid out uh, at least some of those connections and the financial framework that was laid to allow China to rise to the point where it's at now and uh, uh, some of the technical, industrial and, um, and military transfers, legal and otherwise, that have occurred since then. Um, and I think the way to understand China is that it is the template for the idea for total control a total governmental control that they want to roll out everywhere in the world. It's starting in China at this point. And uh, David Rockefeller famously said in his obituary to Mao in New York Times, uh, he said, you know, it, it was a, it was a grand uh, successful experiment um, that, that Mao waged, um, killing tens of millions of his own citizens along the way. But, uh, you know, you break a few eggs to make an omelet, right? And uh, uh, we see that playing out most obviously now with the rollout of the technological overlay on that control grid with the social credit scores and the CCTV and the uh, facial recognition and all of this is coming together now and we can see what's what it's looking like in China. You saw that video go viral on Twitter a few weeks ago about the guy with on the high speed train from I think Beijing to Shanghai and it's got that announcement anything you do on this train will be recorded on your social credit score. Uh, this is coming and we know oh, it's coming. Minority and, uh, report, dude. I think this is why uh, one of the reasons they're using China as kind of that laboratory. They're also using it as the foil exactly as Russia, the Soviet Union, was the foil in the Cold War, which was supported by technological and other types of uh, uh, support from from American industry and, and uh, f uh, financiers that that propped up the Soviet boogeyman for as long as they needed that boogeyman to be propped up. We've seen the ICISIS, al Qaeda boogeyman in the last couple of decades, <laughs> uh, but China is going to be the boogeyman for the 21st century. I'm, I'm, that's the way they're ang angling it. And th there's the same, the same linkages and the same uh, financial uh, infrastructure which under, uh, undergirds all of that. Uh, it's incredibly important to understand that so that we don't get fooled again, so that we, we don't let them pull another Cold War or, God forbid, World War III, um, which is another They're growing split. right under our nose, man, from the expansion of the military bases in the South China Sea. You have what I think it's called the String of Pearls. Uh, you have the One Belt, One Road, which is just – I mean you had uh, Sri Lanka just recently just gave up a port in Sri Lanka to the Chinese for some financial stuff. But I mean not only are there's trade routes, but they're also putting military bases on some of these islands in that string of pearls. And even uh, – what is it called? ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. I've been kind of talking about this for a while. I mean that th these trade deals that are just locking down this area, and it's just growing and growing and growing. I mean it's – I wouldn't say it's a problem, but they're already there. They're taking nation shipping ports for Absolutely. debts that they owe China. To, and to before we know it, they're going to be there. I mean, they're already there, but before Which, we know it. I mean, it, like, let's face it. They're just taking over the old World Bank IMF game. I mean, they, they've been doing this for decades and decades yeah. and decades. And, yeah. But now China's getting in on it. Well, and also if, the, product, the production of their uh, their, their petro chuan. Like, they're, they've moved away from the, the petro dollar as well with their introduction of the, the petro chuan. And if I'm if – I'm, U.S. intelligence. I'm obviously working on a way to get 
and India and China have had skirmishes in that region up there. Um, I'm I'm doing everything I can to if there's going to be if China is going to become that much of a threat, which we know it is. I'm trying to figure out how to get India and China to go to global nuclear war against each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah, and blow exactly. The shit like out the old stuff. British imperial strategy, you want the second strongest power to challenge the the strongest uh, power. Yeah, and yeah. and it's interesting in that context. It was Tillerson last year just to drop the uh, the Indo Pacific region a nomenclature. Now they're not calling it the Asia Pacific. Now it's the Indo Pacific, and they're right. they are definitely trying to build up India as that's that sort of bulwark against China. But I think all sides of this. Are, you know, when you go far enough up, up, the, uh, up the ladder, they're all in on it in a sense. Well, and that's what I said. I told Pat a while ago. Look out for false flags in like northern northern India, because that that Kashmir region, because the one belt one road goes through that area. And even, yeah, and even so in Pakistan, Western China, India and China, uh, there's there's something swirling around there. And now they're actually in this Shanghai Cooperation Organization together. They're all full fledged members of that now. So they have military. Um, joint military exercises and things like that, but they're also, as you say, last year we're at uh, uh, the brink of actual military confrontation in uh, yeah. some some dirt path overpass in some mountain somewhere. Like, what what on earth does this matter? But it's clearly this is Western new, Western uh, China. There's tensions. The, the, there's tensions. the Uyghurs, the, the Islamic Uyghurs in Western China. Those I think are being touched by some of our CIA to radicalize that region to to necessitate. Oh, the U.S. has to be here now because, and this goes straight through. Uh, one about one road straight to Europe, I believe. So, I mean, the chess game, man, like Zbigniew big new Brzezinski said, not a fan, but it's the grand chess board for real. James, do you see uh, Europe becoming any kind of military power? I know that they're they're trying to build up their military now. And I think some people in the U United States are getting a little nervous about that and what that what the implications are for our role in the world, you know, policing and stuff. But do you see them as some, starting to either come together and be in their own kind of military force. Yeah, well, this is the problem because the EU is kind of collapsing in front of our eyes, but the problem is they might fail forward and actually try to consolidate even harder. So, okay, oh, you know, Britain might try to remove itself and maybe they will, maybe they won't. But anyway, we'll just come together even more firmly. And we saw that last year with some forwarding of uh, ideas about uh, formalizing and hardening the, the European, shared European borders and, uh, and, uh, bloating up their European, uh, I forget what it's called, Frontex or whatever, their, their, right. their joint military guard around the borders as a way of is saying to the rising populist public, hey, don't worry, guys, we're all European. We're all in this together. We're all a big collective and we're going to take care of you. And mm -hmm. one aspect of that is the super army that they're they want to create. They've talked about it for years now, and there's at least taking the rhetorical steps forward on that. Well, um, then Macron's I guess the only... We can hope that they collapse before they're able to really <laughs> organize like that, yeah. but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Macron, Macron comes out with the idiotic statement saying that they want European uh, European nations need to build their own army to protect themselves from the United States, which is obviously his his lashing out at Trump for for the way that he's um, talked about Europe not holding up its end of the deal and paying its part in NATO and UN and everything else. But uh, I mean. When I look at Macron, Macron's got uh, what is his approval rating? What twenty percent, something like that over there. And and I mean, I'm I'm surprised they haven't revolted more than just over the gas prices and and hung that guy. <laughs> I just don't know why people don't go after these politicians. Why I think that's one thing about the United States. Why they keep building us up is because there is stability here you know it's like there's no wild like leftist guerrilla army coming and overthrowing washington dc that always business as usual which is great as a civilian you know you're not going to worry about you know all of a sudden there's a coup going on here and there but Sometimes I think it's just like we don't we let these guys get away because they know a, there's never going to be. Yeah, any but these guys are the shadows on the wall. I mean, you can punch the wall and try to get at those shadows, but you're just going to fracture your own hand. And if people go after the politicians, let's string them all up. And that is the exact excuse that the people in control of the real powers uh, right. want to. <clears throat> OK, now ball. we get to crack down on you because you are violent. Look at you saw everybody. You saw <laughs> these guys go crazy. And we nothing, got to get cracked down on them. And we yeah, have nothing. Nothing screams stability like Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is your take on that, James? Uh, as uh, being on the outside, the whole liberal versus conservative here and, you know, how it's just like they're at each other's 
next right now to the, it's like I just had a guy on my podcast who's like very liberal and like the feedback has been insanely negative and uh it makes me upset because i'd like my show to be both sides to hear both sides of the argument because yeah. there is too much one side echo chamber shit but what's your take on like liberal i mean i hear that liberalism leads, leads to nazism but then i look at like a lot of stuff's going on right now with capitalism and how much damage we're doing to the rest of the world and how there's parts of this united states that are straight up third world man straight up third yeah world like what's your whole thoughts on that that whole well thing? look okay this is the canadian and japan's perspective on this so you know <laughs> i'm not just telling anyone how to run their own country but what i'm uh, saying is that there are historical parallels to this this is not some new thing that's just happening for the first time i mean there are different elements to this like the internet and social media and all that which throws a whole monkey wrench in the works but we've seen this before and it's the rise of the polar extremes it's the rise of the communists give rise to the the fascists they feel Eat off each other and it, there comes a point when you got to choose a side because it just keeps getting more and more divided and that's where we're heading and we know where that heads and it heads in the favor of the ultimate controllers who wanted things like world war ii to happen in the first place because again all the million reasons but profit be always being one of the reasons they get to profit from us basically tearing each other apart uh and it's hard it's, it's perhaps impossible to step in once that polarization starts. I mean, how do you stop that process from working? Uh, if I had the golden bullet to that, I would have been firing it, or a silver bullet, I would have been firing it a long time ago, right? So um, I, I don't know what the answers to that is, but clearly this is not a healthy direction for society. But people might argue, hey, maybe it's just part of the pendulum swing. It's got to go this way once in a while to clear things out and get get people back on board because politics is essentially the you know warfare by other means and if we're not if we're not agreeing politically then it's time for warfare and then we go back to agreeing politically again and is there a way to avoid that cycle is the real question yeah if you look at uh the, the documentary the untold history of the united states by oliver stone and his book and uh, if you look at some of the the film some of the old debates like in black and white with nixon and kennedy and and uh you know some even older politicians and, and you look at these debates they're, it's literally the same shit that they're saying today like literally it's like they're saying that it's if you put it in color and you replace them with modern day politicians they're feeding you the same bullshit and i always say how like you know politicians and those in power they capitalize on our awful long-term uh, long-term memory like we we you know i uh vietnam happens and then iraq happens then we're you know we're almost letting syria happen you know and it's like we keep making the same mistake over and over again and we just keep pretending like oh this time is going to be different and we keep falling for the same <laughs> trick over you know yeah. like, <laughs> going uh, tying funny. this back to world war one I, I read this on uh, my uh video the other uh last week um from lord milner's second war talking about this alfred milner who was one of the key men making world war one happened who wrote in 1893 so decades before any of this happened he said my interests do not run on the lines of party and if i can help in however small a way to carry out the objects i have at heart i do not care two straws how the politicians are labeled who execute them and that was exactly what they ended up doing they they rode the conservative Jeez. government when they were in power they 150 rode the fucking years ago gang 100 fucking 50 years ago Exactly. It didn't matter who the public voted for or what they voted for. In 1906, the British public ex explicitly elected Henry Campbell Bannerman on this platform of peace. We have to be the leaders of the world in peace because we're clearly heading towards war. We don't want to go there. People elect him. Immediately, Milner and his uh, gang get their, their guys in the positions of power in that government, and they just continue making the preparations for war. Same thing that Carol Qu Quigley was writing about you know, decades later when he said that the whole point is to get them to, uh, to get the two parties so that there's really no difference, so that you can vote the rascals out every four years, and it makes no difference to the fundamental policies. And once people get into this political game where it's sports teams essentially fighting against yes. each other, Fucking WWE, dude. It, it yeah. reads like a freaking W. I mean, you know, when, when Undertaker lost his streak, I don't know if anybody knows what that means, but he, like, was 22 years and never lost in WrestleMania, and he lost it, dude. People were losing their shit. Grown people lose. I mean, it's almost, it's literally almost the same thing. 
Well, uh, we're emotional creatures. We love to think that we're these logical, you know, machines yes. that look at the facts and we come up come up with these conclusions. But we're emotional creatures, and obviously, we all know the history of Edward Bernays and understanding that, uh, you know, you can manipulate uh, our desires and 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 the way we think. And and we all and, don't know who Edward Bernays is. Let's not let's stop assuming everybody yeah, knows who that is. <laughs> Edward Bernays, seriously, <laughs> well, go he, check out a, a documentary the, called um, the uh, fuck what was it called? Well, century, uh, of century, century of the Self. Century of the Self, yes. Yeah. It's Adam like Curtis. 11 hours, yeah. but it is the biggest. I hate to use this euphemism now because someone told me it's a bad, but the red pill. It's an ultimate red pill to show how, just just like uh, um, Mr. Corbett's video on World War One, how sophisticated these works are. This this work to start World War One lasted a decade plus, and it was like four or five guys who started it. Well, so, yeah. I mean, uh, Adam Curtis, uh, Century of the Self, a very important documentary. Check that oh, out. Man, uh, I mean, very even you know, Noam Chom Chomsky and in, in, uh, Manufacturing Consent talked about it. Uh, you know, another good documentary by, by Richard Grove, uh, State of Mind, The Psychology of Control. They talk about it. I mean, there's tons of great uh, work out there that talk about it. I mean, he's a nephew of Sigmund Freud, you know, wrote Propaganda, the book. Uh, uh, and really, those techniques were used in everything from corporations were using it to government governments to to everything so it's really important i mean i know people does who, it yes yeah go on pat no i was gonna say you know when we go back through history and see how these wars were were put together you know very very complex and sophisticated ways of doing things putting those chess pieces in place um little acts doesn't give anyone here on this panel any kind of hope when we knew um, that the United States certainly assisted big time in arming ISIS um, to take out Assad. Um, does it does it give anybody hope? And I I've got legitimate intelligence from a guy who's very high up uh, in the intelligence community, and he if I I can sit here and tell you and go back through what I've talked about on my podcast about who this guy is, but I don't want to give away who he is because he wants to remain anonymous. Um, you know, I asked him right away did did Trump you know, pull the plug on the ISIS funding. And he said, absolutely, 100%. They got in. But Does didn't he bring it back? Hope? Yeah, but, but what's that? Pat. I thought he brought it back, Pat, too, as well. What, what, what yeah, only the white, the, 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 white, the white helmets have gotten some money, but nothing nothing on the level um, of, of what we've done, you know, in the past under the Clinton and Clinton State Department. And, uh, and from, from oh. this gentleman, you know, his, his um, assessment which is legit, trust me, when you when you know who he is. Uh, maybe over beers you guys can get to meet him uh, someday. I'm sure that, that possibly we will, uh, but uh, the, or let you guys meet him. But um, it, it at least gave me a glimmer of hope that, that Trump is somewhat trying or try, was trying before they got their hooks into him to stop this this ball from from growing and rolling downhill. Well, uh, th this is m my problem with all, all this uh, Trump conversation is that, you know, just like with 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 J James. Corden, I mean, I, believe me, I've had I'm like uh, I'm like these guys. I, I've had uh, Roger Stone on my show. I've had, uh, you know, I've had people from Counterpunch on my show. I've had, you know, Lee Camp, who's progressive on my show. I've had, uh, you know, so many uh, libertarians. I've had so many different. So I'm open to all perspectives. I never tend to believe that I know the truth with a capital T or or that uh, I have it all figured out. I'm constantly readjusting and recalibrating and and but the thing about this Trump thing is that you know, once we start looking for a nip and looking at like okay, he did this positive thing or he did that don't we aren't we almost subconsciously falling into that tribal thinking that we think is so dangerous? So you're so and 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 I understand the the mindset that we all should have, and that we should always be skeptical. Yeah. Uh, and but 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 at the same time, while remaining skeptical, because the more time goes by, the the longer it takes for any indictments to be uh, levied against anybody. The longer it takes for the unredacted FISA documents to be released, the more I think Trump was brought in by the powers that be to potentially get a civil war revved up uh, well i think by what if you look at a lot of james's research i mean uh, one thing you learn is a lot of these things are much more complex than initially it looks like and sure. when, when you look at you know why trump might be doing one thing and not doing another thing we might not find out what 
behind backdoor deals and conversations are happening. And like you know, Jeff said to uh, Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard, we don't know why – we might not necessarily know and understand what the big game plan is quite yet. So it, I think that's that's why I kind of reserve my judgment. I mean, one thing I, yeah. I, I love about James is that he came out with one documentary uh, about uh, Obama's legacy, uh, Legacy of Ashes, uh, soon after he came uh, came uh, left office. And then uh, soon after, I, I don't know if it was a couple weeks or a couple months, later he had a, a, a short uh, documentary called uh, Trump filling the swamp like he I, I think <laughs> that's that's really important like w- w- I, I think it's very easy to fall uh, to fall in love and want to believe that this person is the the sure, you know, sure. he's gonna and and uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's almost like, you know, you, you briefly brought up the border conversation, uh, you know, uh, the Mexicans coming in here and stuff like that and protecting our borders. I think that's really e- we can easily get caught up in that, too, and be like, well, who's going to protect us? Well, now we need more government. Right. Because the, we have this boogeyman Mexicans that we don't want coming into our country and ruining right, our, our right. liberty, you know, and it's it, it, and so it's like. You know, it, it it almost works in their favor. Instead of doing what we should be doing, and that's probably getting instead of spending all this money overseas, uh, you know, blowing shit up. If we help Mexico right. get get on their feet, believe me, I know people from Guatemala. I know people from Mexico. They haven't seen their families in years. They don't want to be here unless they, you know, they literally needed to be because they had no other uh, hand, right, right. chance of survival. Let there. me ask James. I want to ask James this specific question because this has been crossing my mind for the past week. Um, we see the eroding support of Saudi Arabia in this country, at least by uh, the media and many of our politicians. And what what I see happening, um, at least in the bigger screen, you know, the board, Syria is is destroyed literally. I mean, it's it's falling apart. Russia has has helped hold it back together by by a shoestring. Um, so Syria is almost done. The last Middle Eastern nation on that list to be destroyed was Iran. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what a perfect play if America were to make it almost obvious or or lure Iran into thinking that America will not defend Saudi Arabia anymore, almost giving Iran the green light to attack Saudi Arabia so that ultimately we can destroy it. And I I think that, you know, that's that's not a far thought in my mind. James, what do you think? That's the kind of calculus that goes on all the time. So I think it's not um, wildly implausible. The only thing is I don't think Iran has any intention of attacking Saudi Arabia, and I don't think they're going to be goaded into it um, by such a ploy. But I think it is extremely important to get to the bottom of why, exactly why at this time the plug seems to be being pulled on Saudi Arabia. And I'm wondering if this is maybe just an internal, like, uh, Saudi... The, the, the structure of the government, maybe they just don't want clown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman in power, so they're trying to maneuver uh, one of the other It could signs. be a coup, right? There could be yeah, a coup going on. Yeah, it could be on. that kind of coup type of thing. Because I just, I don't get it from a geostrategic point why they're doing it right now. They've always had the sort of Damocles hanging over uh, Saudi Arabia, because they can always just pull out the the 28 pages or whatever, they can redact, unredact some of the redacted parts and just go, oh, look, it was Saudi behind 9-11. Okay, now we're going to eliminate you guys. Could they could do yeah. that at any time. And the same and, could be said, the same could be said strategically as to, you know, while we're in the process of destroying Syria um, for our purposes of, of you know, uh, running pipelines or, or whatever it is we want to do, um, and also because he's against the American dollar, um, what a great way to suck Iran into that, because we know that a lot of Iranian forces have gotten involved in that. And so I think that they're they're pulling at the at the legs of the dog, which is Iran um, yeah. from a couple of different angles, in my mind, yeah. trying, trying but to there's get there's got to be something of that going on, because clearly the Could main cross the petro dollar. Could it be that Iran uh, that Saudi Arabia? Maybe he sees a writing on the wall and is wants to get off the petrodollar and wants to stop participating in that. And the we'll long this or, into or the, 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 the deal we made, the deal we made yeah. with Kissinger back in the day. We'll refine your oil as long as you make the United States dollar exactly. your petrodollar, so, and we no longer exactly. need them for oil because we have oil everybody everywhere. You know, here yeah. In our the country. Saudis have been the backbone of the the U.S. dollar system for a few decades now in that kind of quid pro quo. quo. But now the question is whether they're going to stay under that umbrella and uh, whether we want them there and all of that. Those kinds of uh, decisions are being made right now. And part of that calculus is the uh, growing relations between Saudi Arabia and China. I was just going to say. China, it's it, dude. China's it. Yeah, 
And Saudi, if, if yeah, the U.S. is now a net oil exporter, if you can believe that. So clearly Saudi Arabia sees China as the big growing market for their oil that uh, they have to, they know which side their bread's buttered on in the future. If they cozy up more with China and get into the petro yuan system, then obviously the U.S. wouldn't that's want that. What, so that's the kind of long-term strategic. Sam doing. always says it, man. Such an interesting time to be alive, and it really is. We are seeing, an, in a game of risk or checkers, we are seeing some big moves made. And, of course, they take kind of decades to do, but if you're paying attention to, you know, to, to the breeze, you're seeing like it, the winds of change have definitely come for whether it's the petrol dollar, the growth of China, I mean, Saudi Arabia having to make that decision, Iran. And again, the PSYOP continues. I mean, obviously, Iran's on the target still. Syria's on the target list still. It's it's very, very fascinating. And when you and when you skew it through the filter of, like I said, your movie and how people need to realize how these things are so just manufactured, maybe not by a few people, but sometimes by a very few people. And the implications are so huge and millions and millions are affected from, you know, you know, Gulf of Tonkin. Jeez, how many millions Vietnamese died over a lie? You know, or or American soldiers and, you know, all of it, Iraqi kids, women under our sanctions or what's going on in Syria. I mean, it's Yemen, insane. Dude. Yemen. And it's all it's, it's generally almost all horseshit and having to go back to these financial bankers. But we see these people still lined up, ready to go to war, glass parking lot, the whole fucking place. Blah, blah, blah. It's like but it means. But if it means France having seven dollar a gallon or liter gas and us having two dollars a gallon gas, do you support it? I, I fuck gas. Fuck. fuck. <laughs> I agree. Fuck all this shit. Yeah. I mean, the pain. I mean, like, dude, I mean, my phone is a, a, what it is because, because Chinese people live a, a horrible life to make that phone. That upsets me, dude. It does upset me. I have to participate in it because through, you know, what we do, we need these phones to make this stuff all happen so we can have a career talking about what we want to talk about. Oh, yeah, they, so they put it together in China, but they mine the shit in Africa somewhere. You know, I mean, yeah, it's all it's spread. Just, the suffering is well spread out. For what it's worth, for what it's worth, I've stepped away from from Twitter this year and realized I never needed it in the first place. And I've already decided once this stupid surveillance device that I carry around in my pocket is done, once it gives up the ghost, that's it. I'm going back to flip phones. I was just going to say, I need to be like so damn bad. I need to be like my 75 year old father, dude, have a flip phone. I don't do, you know what I mean? Just old school. Well, you want to talk about, you know, modern day Edward Bernays. I mean, you want social media, these, uh, this technology, the same way Edward Bernays understood how to pull at our, you know, get into our subconscious, get to our desires. I mean, these, and you've had people who work for Facebook and, and, and other people talk about it, how they are, I mean, we're getting serotonin dumps and all these happy chemicals every time we see a like. Every, I mean, there's a reason Bing. why why Facebook Bing. doesn't have a dislike button because it wants you to keep it feeling good when you go on that page. So and then you keep going back and you keep going back and, you, and you're just holding on to every notification and you have to get a watch because, you know, God forbid you, you don't check your phone mm-hmm. and, and you know, so it's like it's it's so crazy. And, and even though I'm not a huge fan of the Huxleys, man, Aldous Huxley said it best. And I just I've repeated this. And there's going to come a point in time and we're here where we're going to enjoy. We're going to require our enslavement. And that's what essentially, you know, all these little things are that just I, I know we don't get it. We think, oh, wow, well, I can just pay for this with my phone. How convenient. Well, I get, you know, that people don't get digital footprints and how data is the new oil, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, you know, this nice new convenience and I can. Keep up with the Kardashians well, so much better with my well, phone. Well, there's a there's a great video on uh, on YouTube called "Free is a Lie," and I forget I, I forget who the guy is who did the video. It's a short video, and he talks about how yeah, you get this Google phone and you get all this all these free services. But he goes into it's like, but what they're really doing is they're you know all this mega data. They're paying attention to where you are, who you're with, and they're selling all this information. So we like to look at it as like it's all free, but it's not. And we're giving up t- privacy. We're giving up uh, our personal information. Yes. I mean. Uh, yeah, you know, fa- Facebook and Google, they've all done studies where they can figure out, you know, when you're going to go through a divorce before you actually go through it. You know, uh, when you're going to date somebody before you actually announce you're dating somebody, like just by figuring out where you are and who you're hanging out with and what your status updates are. And uh, so, uh, you know, we, we like to think, but th- this is the thing. And James and I have talked Inter- about this. AI. James and, right. and I have talked about this where there's generations growing up today where this is the their norm. This is the world they grow, they grow up in. Yes. So the people who have kind of 
been able to kind of live in an analog world and then see things transition, we kind of have a better perspective. But this is the new norm. It's like, how do you stop them from accepting what is yeah. the norm today? And I think that's the scary part. That's they're uh, they're and, born they're born digital. Or are you a bunch of old guys who are telling <laughs> you know young people that like, hey, you know, you uh, video games are going to do this, or TV is going to ruin the, uh, society and culture, and you know, my dad suddenly doesn't seem so crazy anymore. Yeah. yeah. This generation, honestly, like you just said, man, we're at a very crucial time because we we remember cassette tape and CDs and we remember, you know, rotary phones. I mean, there's going to come a time and you see videos online now. I don't know how real they are, but they're like, what is, you know, older cats throw down a rotary phone to their kid. They're like, what's this? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so we, you know, now, like you said, they are absolutely born digital hey. and they're just. So awesome. while we're holding this conversation, sorry to interrupt you, my Facebook uh, came up with an ad and I clicked on it. Shut How to up. Build underground survival <laughs> bunker from scratch. Are you shitting me? Uh, uh, I remember uh, being a kid and seeing all, guys, all these people complaining about. Yeah. What did they say? Complain? I remember being a kid seeing all these these people complain about the devil and music and like what like all oh, you fuck old crazy people and then you just see this stuff now with with rap, hip hop and rap and it's so blatant right now and I, I'm not trying to be like there's a da, da, but it's like there's dark art stuff in that and I remember mocking those people back in the day and I go they were just trying to warn us and we just laughed in their faces because we just wanted to be like we just wanted to free love and be all that stuff and it's yeah, like man. There's, well, there's it's free love and then there's just like straight up dark art stuff and i don't and, and, and social engineering i think you and i had that conversation the other day i mean it's no accident that gangster rap thrived in those days not more conscious rap and around that same time crack cocaine is introduced around that same time the, the prison system gets commercialized i mean it's like this is social engineering 101 there's a lot of guns and there's a lot of guns there's a lot of guns in the ghetto all of a sudden Absolutely. And yeah. that doesn't negate personal responsibility, yeah. but at the end of the social day, man, you create poverty, social engineering and poverty. You create poverty, man. You're going to find all of these different elements, dude. So it's, I mean. And James is thoroughly disgusted that we've gone off on so many tangents. Oh. <laughs> Not at all. I'm enjoying the conversation. And, and, and I think the, the rap, and James and I have talked about this, about, uh, you know, the uh, gangster rap in the 90s. And, 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 you know, some people get in debate, like, was it manufactured or was it just promoted? And I don't think it matters. I think either way, uh, if you're manufactured, Manufacturing consent. If you're trying to uh, control, uh, you know, young people, the youth, and you know, music's a big part of that. I mean, people we, people yes. joke around about how if Kanye West ran for president, he'd win. Be, just be, not because he has great ideologies and views and perspectives, but because it, it's it's a popularity contest. And uh, so, I mean, if you're trying to control, uh, you know, or manufacture consent, control what people think, control the way uh, they look at things, why wouldn't you get into things like art and music and, and you know, all these things and slowly start molding people's perspectives? And so I, I don't think nothing, nothing, I don't think anything gets popular now that MK Ultra came out in the uh, 60s and 70s. I don't think anything gets popular without uh, without. An, uh a like visible the hand. And the controllers, right. This is uh, yeah. This is the deeper it. level of no analysis way. because it's it's not organic versus manufactured. It's that yeah. I mean, you create the conditions for a whatever Maryland man or whatever to come up, and then you promote that. You you use your power in the industry to promote this person or that that idea, and then and it becomes the popular yeah. thing. And you'd be amazed at how many uh, how how many famous people are, are military brats that are the children of uh, high up military people. They, yeah, they funny how that people. works. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it is kind of crazy, and it, you don't see it till you see it. When you see it, it's kind of like, oh my god, it was like it's right there. I, I maybe maybe I'm just hopeful. I do think the internet is the great equalizer. Uh, I do think there is a push to uh, regulate it. So they can keep it status quo, but I think it's all blood in the water. They can they can knock Alex Jones off of YouTube. I see his videos everywhere. Right. Uh, you know, they, if they're knocking off, I was not knocking off James, who I think gives out real information to me. Right, you know, right. Say, is well, a bigger let, let me bring the downer to the conversation then, because you know the first place that they're really going to make the organized, concerted effort to push AI technology is going to be online through social media to the point where you don't know who you're interacting with as a person yes. or if it's part of this botnet that they're going to create and personalities 
you can yeah. generate it that you can't tell from the real thing. We're, things things are about to get crazy. Really I've already had some very crazy. James. I've already had some very heated debates with bots. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't even doubt it. Yeah. Oh. I'm actually happy I'm old that I you know that I'm almost aging out of this time where you got to concern yourself with all that stuff like you know <laughs> it's just like oh no, hence, the, the, hence the name of Sam Tripoli's uh, most recently dropped stand up comedy No Fucks yeah that you can, that you can pick you up know? on Vimeo ladies and gentlemen so I, I'm actually no, kind of well, um, the if if you if you ever if you ever get messages uh, whether it's Facebook Twitter uh, or you know, people trying to argue with you, debate with you. I've gone back and I'm trying to think of the, the way that I outed them. I've outed a couple bots where they get discombobulated on some of the ways that you ask things. And dang it, I, I worded some things and I, I, um, but either way, uh, there's, there's ways of, of messing with them to where you know that they don't know how to answer that. Maybe. That. That's why they were so upset by the NPC meme because they were literally NPCs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is crazy how like forever it was like the liberal side was coming up with this stuff that fight the establishment, and now you see kind of conspiracy side coming up with it. Well, because when there's an idea, when you believe in an ideology, that's just like it, it causes you to be blind and it makes you not be able to be more creative in my opinion that's why you like, like, like bruce lee said man they try to solidify that which was once fluid these conversations like we're having we're not necessarily subscribed to right left or are necessarily dogmatic about our philosophies we are we are flexible we are malleable you know what i mean so but, you flexible know, that i can so flexible that i can point out to sam that his headphones are made of petroleum probably i'd probably probably raise Video active at this moment. <laughs> I just want to say something because I, I got a jam. I just want to say something real quick that being on this show with you guys, when I started my show like two years ago, like I would never have ever believed I'd be on with all you guys. I've been, you know, I've been Jeffrey. I talk to a lot, but every, everybody else here, I'm fans of your work, you know. And I, I mean, I've been following Pat forever, but to be on with you guys has been a real honor. And, and like, I really love what you guys are doing. You guys are, you guys are very important to everything that that you know. You're important to humanity, in my opinion. To be We're on the same you. team, man. We got to stay on the same team. And then the 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 inserts that the inserts that are happening. You know those plants that are happening from the from the elitists that are that are putting people in place that seem like they're part of our community, and then they go off on some fucking skewed tangent um, on holograms hitting the, the the twin towers and stuff like that. You know, that's the thing is where we need to stick together and and filter all that bullshit out and get get rid of those people quickly and not pay attention to them and, and keep doing what we're doing and stay on the path. I think that's so important because it, we've seen it in the alternative media a lot in the last couple of years, just people turning on each other yeah. and and just because they don't agree on one specific thing. And there's tons of topics that I'm sure we all probably disagree For with. For sure. You know, I, I've had I, I mean, I've hosted debates with, uh, you know, Adam Kokesh and Hunter Moss on Libertarian and, and, and whatnot. And, and just because I think it's important for people to, to learn that, hey, just because we disagree doesn't mean we can't try to have a discussion. And if our goal, Absolutely. and if our goal's the same, and that's the most important thing. Like, what's your goal? Like, we all want to have a safer place for our families, a better world. We we all, you know, we're all fighting power and trying to uh, get. We're get, truth seekers. Yeah, we're, we're truth, truth seekers. We're truth seekers. We're all trying to. Fight. I used to like to get lied to. That's my biggest thing. That's really what it is. I used to like to get lied to. I like to know to the best of my ability. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. But I take like. Okay, uh huh. You know, money, who gets the money, who gets the power, and how does it fit within how history is played out? If all those line up. I think there's a good chance it might be true, but even then, I don't think it's one of. I just like, I don't like getting lied to, and I like to investigate. Well, and, yeah. Well, we, Actually, I just yeah. pulled a quote from Smedley Butler um, for my part three of this World War One conspiracy, where he said he was trying to educate the soldiers out of the sucker class, and that's a good way of putting it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and. So I'd like to think I'd like to think that's part of what I'm doing, but uh, it's really nothing so grandiose. It's just that I am interested in history. I'm interested in how the world really works. I have got this platform where there are people who are supporting me to do this work, so I'm going to do it. This is amazing. This is hey, wonderful. Just like, hey, we're on the ripple effect, man. Where we're doing, we are the butterfly flapping its wings this in Tampa, it. Florida, this creating a monster in China, ladies and gentlemen. Right. You never know. Yo, I, um, but at the end of the day, if nothing else, I think my experience just shows what is possible now. I am 
literally an English teacher in Japan who became this podcaster and I'm doing this from my <laughs> living room in Japan. Like, what on earth is this even? I don't know, but I'm just going to continue doing it while That's people trip. are doing I've been this. watching you for that years, is. sir. I've been watching you for years. <laughs> what a wonderful time to be alive. Yeah. Hell and, yeah. And oh, Sammy, you got, a, you got a set tonight, don't you? Yeah, I got Yeah, I got a, It's called Third Eye Comedy and I, I'm getting like Jimmy Dore and Graham Elwood and all these like outside the box thinkers to do a show together. We'll see if anyone shows up, but I'm super excited for it. Dude, com- awesome, dude. Comedians oh, are are now the new, I mean, they, they are the ones breaking the boundaries and have the ability. I mean, people like Sam who are, you know, willing to go out on a limb and talk about controversial issues. I just had Jim Florentine on last night and we he went on a huge vaccine big pharma conversation and it, it's awesome that you know you guys are, are willing to do that and uh, I can't thank you guys en- uh, enough for being on uh, like, like I said I, I think we all come from different backgrounds and hopefully you know everything from James's fans to, to Pat and Jeff Sam's my fans everybody can come together realize that even though we're all slightly different we're all here for the same goal and, and that's much more important than falling into because like we talked about in the beginning of the show exactly what they want us to do is not focus on our, our similarities, but take those little differences and just fight till the end of time about those things. Let's let's just right. fight, you know, and, and, and then those in power who really don't give a shit about ideology, you know, it's like that movie network, you know, there, you know, there is, uh, or there's only DuPont, there's only, you know, uh, these corporations, those are the people who are pulling the strings and, and those are the ones that we should be, uh, we should be putting our do attention you believe on. in the, and I'll ask this one last thing. Uh, do you um, voice your opinion on this, your vote? Do you think in our lifetime we'll ever see a Rothschild hanging from a tree? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Huh? Yes or no? One can only wonder. <laughs> I think it's very possible. Uh, I mean... I would like to see something happen. Well, yeah, I think it's possible. I don't think it would change a thing about the way the world works. Yeah, I don't think. See, this is where I think. I think what, like, like Sam said to quote him again. Uh, I think the revolution will be podcasted. I think when we talk about people like Smedley Butler, you know, you talk about the business, the business plot. You know, it's conspiracy that you know almost happened a long time ago. And it's like if that shit can happen, if what what happened yesterday, fifty five years or tomorrow, uh, fifty five years ago. Uh, you know, if that can happen, then then what the fuck so, can't what can't happen? And I think people so do have we to. We all have to. So do we all have to. So do we all have to come to the point where to not support this machine? Okay, a we have to ride bicycles because um, we can't spend any money on gas. Two, we got to grow our own food. We got to raise cattle and chickens in our back fucking yards. We got to dig our own well so we don't pay for water. We got to have solar panels so we have our own power. So that's that's what you're saying we have to do instead of hang all the motherfuckers. <laughs> well, yeah, hang them, and then who takes the place of all of those positions? It'll be yeah. the same. Yeah, he's gonna say you can't. Know. You can't legislate. Know, you cannot um, legislate evil, dude. You, there will or be even just... worse could happen, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Or even worse yeah. could happen, and probably would because they've get, got that. Backup. I know. Well, I know there weren't people jumping up and down to replace Quisling. Well, when when they kill Gaddafi, when they kill Saddam, when they kill, you know, they are they're sold the same idea. Like this per- evil person, if we take him down, things will be better. And then it's just another corrupt person in place. Never gets better. It never gets Ever. better. And and it's so never I'm, about an individual. It's always an ideology. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I won't hold you guys up. I know it's a day before Thanksgiving, so hopefully you guys have a wonderful holiday with your fa- friends and family. Uh, ha- have a drink. Uh, and, uh, and Happy and, Thanksgiving. And, and enjoy, guys. I can't thank you guys enough for being on. Hopefully we can uh, do it again. Of course, the guy who writes all the emails and put this together isn't even seen on camera, which sucks. But <laughs> uh, it, it is what it is. Well, we appreciate it. Appreciate you, brother. We got the best. Dude, of- you did a great job putting this together. Thank you so much. You know- yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. And hopefully, uh, I know James is a very busy guy. Uh, Sam, Pat, uh, you know, Jeff, you guys all have other shows and other uh, work. But if we can do this, you know, even if it's twice a year, if it's, you know, a couple times a year, whatever we can do, let's come together. Let's quarterly. Keep yeah. yeah, quarterly. Yeah, quarterly. If, if, if possible, let's let's do it. Let's uh, I mean, we had a great conversation and let's I, let's let, let's keep let's keep the tinfoil ripple farm report going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of this episode. Dude. I 
think it is. I think I think uh, I think it is. I spend like a, a whole month coming up with names, and and Jeff in like two seconds just threw them all away. He's like, just it's that was awesome. So yeah, maybe maybe that's what we'll call I'll it. Put this out as soon as possible, if you guys don't mind. Is that if yeah, that's absolutely. Issue. Yeah, but whatever you can send us this, I'd love to put this out because it was an excellent conversation. Yeah. Thank you guys. Awesome. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll Thank touch you. Up. Good to see all of you. Love you guys, man. Happy Thanks, Thanksgiving. Guys. Love you. Thanks, everybody. Take care.